Hello, good evening, everybody. Once again, my name is Ali Ahmedi, uh, consultant uh, for TechMill on their webinar series, uh, going through what futures are and explaining how they work in the market. And this evening, as we've done over the last few webinars, we'll be discussing uh, a specific sector within uh, the futures that are offered. It will be the S&P 500 index today. Um, just like the last few webinars, we've discussed other uh, various sectors from energy and metals and agriculture to interest rates, and we'll be discussing the S&P 500 index this evening. And as we speak right now, the S&P uh, 500 is trading at 41.19 and a half, and it's about flat on the day. Uh, so uh, it's been very volatile. Uh, for those that are paying attention to the uh, markets, obviously, over the last few weeks, uh, it's been a very volatile year for that matter. Uh, but uh, with the interest rates increasing and so forth, it's creating that that uh, volatility uh, to to increase and uh, provide opportunity, uh, as well as ways to uh, protect yourself, depending on what type of portfolio you are running and managing. Uh, to get into tonight's webinar, as I discussed, you know, we're going to be talking about the S&P 500. Uh, this chart here uh, gives us, uh, let me enlarge it, enlarge it for you, uh, gives us an indication of how, since its inception, the S&P 500 has done, uh, you know, dating back to 1920s. Here you see here. Uh, the Great Depression, and then all the way through the years to where it is now. Um, from its inception, it's plus or minus uh, 12 percent, 11 and a half, 12 percent um, uh, increase the S&P 500. But as you know, year to date, at the time of putting this together, uh, the S&P 500 year to date is down 13 percent, 13 or so percent. It's been down as low as 21 percent on the year. It's made some somewhat of a, let's say, a uh, a a bullish kick, uh, if you will, over the last uh, three weeks or so. Uh, mainly the last two weeks, last week of, of July, it's made a, a surge uh, based on the earnings from several tech giants, uh, Apple and Google and so forth, beating expectations, which uh, in the tech sector, we'll discuss further and later on in the webinar this evening, but the way that the S&P 500 works, uh, it's based on weighted capitalization. So uh, the most weighted capitalization by sector in the S&P 500, number one is the technology sector, number two is the healthcare sector, and number three uh, is the financial sector. So whenever you get uh, positive or negative news coming out of the tech sector is going to uh, show up in the activity immediately on the S&P 500. But this just gives you a graph here of since inception, how it's done over the last, you know, close to 100 years, plus or minus, and uh, throughout its history. What we're going to be discussing tonight are outlooks. And before we get into outlooks, at the time of this particular uh, slide yesterday uh, put together, uh, this is the current uh, ES or the S&P 500 mini contract. Uh, it was trading at 360 uh, for the month of June 2022, and it trades. Uh, you know, you get four contract cycles on the S&P 500. Uh, you you have uh, March, uh, June, September, and December. Uh, so you got four months. This is the September. So if you look at the current one. As of yesterday, it was priced in at, at 360 spot 40. The December of 2022 futures contract was trading at 361.34. And if we go out to June 2023, it's trading at it was trading yesterday at 361.78. So you're not seeing too much, let's say, fluctuation in the futures uh price between the December and the June. Uh, December 2022 and, and June 2023 pricing, uh, but it has moved quite a bit in the last, the index that is, has moved quite a bit here 
uh, in the last two weeks, mainly last week specifically. Uh, now getting into the outlook itself and what it what what goes on and what's happening in the in the uh, index itself. The E-mini uh, S&P 500, uh, it has a contract size, so we're going to have a refresher. We've discussed this along with other futures contracts that are traded uh, in future secur securities uh, within specific sectors. If, this, if you can recall, for those of the, that have been following along the webinar series from the very beginning, we were discussing you know, what futures are and how they're used and what specific contracts are available on the TickMill platform and learning how to value uh, each uh, sector because each tick value varies from sector to sector. Uh, and as a refresher, uh, I'm doing this refresher here because the, the E-mini uh, S&P 500 is the most traded futures contract uh, in the market at the moment. Um, so it has a contract size of $50 times the value of the S&P 500. It's traded on the CME, that's the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and other international exchanges. It allows investors to hedge or speculate on the price movements of the S&P uh, 500 index. Uh, just as I mentioned, it is the most actively traded e-mini contract in the world, and contracts are available on, in, uh, for March, June, September, and December expiry dates on each calendar year. Now, the e, uh, the e mini S&P moves in uh, their, their tick increments in quarter points, 0.25 point increments, and each one of those increments equates to a $12.50 US dollar value, uh, depending on what side of the trade you're on. Uh, but each way it moves for or against, it's a $12.50 move, and therefore a one, pit, uh, one point move or four ticks would equate to a $50 gain or loss. Now, uh, at the time of this, uh, yesterday it was trading at 41.30, the S&P 500. Right now it's currently trading at 41.23 and a half. So um, in the year-to-date performance through, through the end of July, so we're talking about last Friday, today's Tuesday. So we're talking two trading days to go. It closed uh, uh, for the first half of the year. Uh, a year to date, it's down 13.89%. Now the S&P 500 all-time high was at 48.18, which was also reached this calendar year way back uh, at the turn of the year in, on January 3rd. Now, the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index. I mentioned that at the beginning of, of the webinar. And the performance of the index's largest constituents will play a major role in whether or not the S&P 500 falls or gains further the remainder of the year. Now, tech, I told you, is the highest weight to the index, followed by healthcare and then financials. This is coming from Forbes, an article out of Forbes. Now, uh, for those of you that have been following along with, with my webinar series, I like to provide uh, bits and pieces of data, information, and analytical research, analysis, et cetera, uh, throughout that's relevant to the topic that we're discussing throughout a, a broad time frame, not necessarily pinpointed to where we are today, and I do that for a reason so that, you know, for investors or traders looking to get into futures themselves, we already know that they have a level of sophistication and needs to be understood properly, but at the same time, uh, not to get carried away with the current news and the type of trend that the media will lead uh, traders and investors, the narrative that they want to, to everyone to follow along with. So I go out and I find bits and pieces just to let you know that there is a lot of information out there, specifically when it comes to this particular security itself, the, the, the S&P 500 as an index, uh, so that you're going to have a broad range of opinions. So this goes back to a lot of the, you've heard, you hear me say it every single webinar, you've got to be able to do your research and come up with your own strategy and so forth. But when it comes to the S&P 500, it could not be more relevant, not that it's more relevant than any others, but you're going to find a whole lot more of information out there on this particular uh, security 
uh, and you could end up getting lost. So you've really got to, to focus in and, and find uh, relevance and where we are today with the current environment based on where we were historically. Uh, we are in uncharted territory. We can't say this is an exact, uh, uh, let's say, photocopy of where we were uh, back in the 80s or back in the 70s or back in the 20s, etc. But we can take some correlations when it comes to interest rate. How did the market do uh, raising interest rates? How did they do inflation? Uh, rising inflation environment, how did the market do, et cetera, et cetera. So from Forbes, you know, they come out with a brutal start to the year. The markets got only worse in June 2022. So we're going back now a month uh, or a little more than a month. Uh, and the S&P closed out the first half of the year down 21%. So if you go back, you know, the, the markets pulled back plus or minus 8% 8, 8 the month of July. So at the time of this writing, you know, they're talking about what happened at the end of June, and it was down 21%, which was the steepest first half loss seen in more than five decades, leaving the index firmly in bear market territory. Now, the S&P 500 posted daily declines on the 56% of trading days this year, which is a, an about face, which is a complete opposite from the trend over the prior decade when daily gains were more typical occurring 55% of the trading days. So we have basically a complete shift and change uh, or paradigm of what has been happening over the last decade as to what's happened in the first half of this year. Uh, a myriad of related factors explains the widespread route in the markets. June saw another spike in key inflation and the key inflation report after prices have been rising at the fastest pace in decades. The Fed aggressively ratcheting, ratcheting up interest rates to tame this inflation, and there are continued supply chain issues stemming from COVID-19 disruptions and the ongoing war in Ukraine, all of which has contributed to increased worries of another that another recession is coming. Now, uh, speaking of recession, the data has come out uh, in theory, uh, not in theory, in black and white terminology, we are in a recession because we've had now two quarters back to back with negative growth, which is the definition of recession. But you're gonna have a lot of these analysts come out and say, well, this or well, that, but we're not getting into what I think and why I think is better than what they think. We're not gonna get into that type of debate. It's just where we are and what's happened uh, with the economy in the US specifically with, and dealing with the S&P 500 index. Now, re recall, this came out at the end of June, so one month has passed. This is from Globalt Investments. Uh, the portfolio manager's name is Tom Martin. And regarding recession, so much attention is being paid to the timing and how bad will it be. The questions and impact on stock prices are most relevant when thinking about the next recession. There are a lot of law cards going forward, for, and July offers a lot of good information for assessing the strength of the economy. When you have, when you have uh, increased uncertainty, you want to reduce the risk you are taking in your portfolio. He also highlights that value versus growth, where the, that debate, growth stocks versus value stocks, for much of the year, value stocks were outperforming growth stocks. Now, value stocks are, uh, you know, they're all large capitalized stocks in the S&P 500. And how you define or differentiate between a growth stock and a value stock is pretty much which one is paying dividends or higher dividends uh, than others. So companies that are paying no dividends to very small dividends are more growth oriented than companies that are paying higher dividends uh, throughout the, their, their uh, quarterly reports and uh, earnings. This is from Axe Investments. The CEO there is Greg Basuk. Uh, now, this coming out at the end of January, uh, the end of June, apologies. We think July is going to be very reflective or similar to, similar to what we have seen in June. The uncertainty and volatility that's been happening in the market and the underlying factors driving that are very likely to continue. As long as inflation remains a big topic, 
it makes sense to invest in inflation-sensitive assets like commodities, cyclical stocks that historically did well when prices are rising, and TIPS, which are treasury inflation-protected securities. So here we have this investment bank. We have the CEO coming out. And their forecast at the, after the first half of the year, quarter end of June, uh, expecting much of the same that happened in June to play out in July. Well, here we are now today being August 2nd. Well, we know that the market pulled back, uh, shouldn't pull back, came back, uh, or bounced back uh, eight percentage points and, you know, has had a strong showing last week and it's trading, you know, right now it's up 10 points at 41.28 back to almost the time that uh, when I made this uh, slideshow yesterday. So, uh, you can see the, I don't want to call it discrepancy, but the differences of, you know, what financial firms and analysis uh, come out with based on their narrative and their strategy of what and, and or how they are dissecting and seeing the market. So, you know, here he comes at the end of June saying we're going to see the same uh, type of uh, uh, market volatility and behavior that we saw in June. And the reality of it, it, it just wasn't the case. This one, uh, an article from uh, market.businessinsider.com uh, with a bank of, from an analysis from Bank of America, the S&P 500 could fall another 23% from where we are now in a worst case scenario as the stock market prices in one third chance of recession, says Bank of America, okay? Uh, the S&P 500 could tumble to 3,000 by the year end of 2022. Now note, this would have the S&P 500 down approximately 37% for the year 2022. This article came also at the end of the first half of uh, this year, end of June, beginning of July. So at that point in time, the market was down 20, 21%. You add another uh 23%, well, I'm sorry, the market at the time of this was down 18% when this, mar when this article came out. So, you know, you're looking at another 30, it could be a total of a 37, 38, rounded off to plus or minus 40% drop for the S&P 500 uh, overall for this year, calendar year, in their worst case scenario. They're not saying that this is going to happen. They're not forecasting it, but they're forecasting a worst case scenario that they could see uh, the S&P 500 dropped down to the 3,000, maybe 3,100 level from where it is now, which would be a 1,000 point drop, 1,100 point drop from where it's trading right now. Uh, analysts pointed out that the current bear market is the 27th bear market since 1929, and historically they have resulted in a 35% average decline. This falls in line with B of A's worst case scenario using its equity risk premium framework. So they have their uh, let's call it software that they use to work on the analytical and the numbers and the data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, from a historical sense, when a bear market is in play, what they're saying is that the average result is a 35% decline in the market. And if you took, if you take it from the time of when this article was, was uh, uh, printed uh, and released, and, and they're factoring in a 37% worst case scenario drop in the market this year, well, it's, you know, 35, 37, that's close enough uh, for it to fall in line with the previous historical data of the 27 bear markets that have historically happened. Now, Bank of America recommended staying long on, on the energy sector and avoid consumer discretionary stocks, pointing out that energy has outperformed the S&P 500 this year by 44%. Now, uh, how, is, how is this possible? Well, this gets back to what's going on geopolitically uh, and within the commodities sector specifically. Uh, we saw oil spike up um, and we're, we're still seeing the ramifications of high gasoline prices in the United States and worldwide for that matter. Uh, so you can see how energy stocks, uh, you know, Exxon, Chevron and Shell, they all are reported earnings uh, over the last few days, and they all beat estimates by a lot. They've made billions of dollars in the last quarter combined. If uh, if I recall, it was close to, 
I think 40, 50 billion dollars between those three conglomerates, uh, they, they, they uh, were, were profitable. So uh, you can see now how that 44% beat of the market took place or is taking place. This is from Yahoo Finance. From a, this is a, a technical analyst. This is a technical analysis uh, article that came out on July 1st. So this is also dated uh, one month just to show you um, how things play out. So you, if you read something that's dated today, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be accurate or 100% true or false for that matter. But this is why I give this information uh, and discuss the outlook in an informal uh, discussion. This is from Christopher Lewis. Uh, the S&P 500 has gone back and forth during trading sessions as we continue to see a lot of lackluster performance in this market. Ultimately, I think this is a market that goes lower, perhaps trying to test the 3,700 level, which we've broken, by the way. Uh, rallies at this point are to be sold into at first signs of exhaustion. Now, what that means is we're considered in a rally based on, okay, if 3,700 is level, we're, we're 400 points above that. And if you start to see it kind of sputter, where today it's trading flat, you're not seeing a large uh, uh, increase in, in percentage points on the day uh, on to the upside. But if this were to continue, let's say day in and day out, and it starts to get tiring, that's what he means by the exhaustion of it, then sell the rally. Uh, that's what he means by that. And he believes that it's not until we break above 4,000, the 4,000 level that you can take a, uh, take a, uh, take it really as being serious. Now, if we break that level, we could overcome a large round psychologically significant figure we would take out of the 50-day exponential moving average. That would be bullish, perhaps sending the market up to the 4,200 level. We're not too far away from the 4,200 level as we speak right now. A break above the 4,200 level obviously is a very strong sign uh, as well. And at that point, I would consider buying. Until then, the markets need to prove prove itself to me, meaning him, or the Fed needs to change its monetary policy. Um, so right now, the Fed hasn't changed its monetary policy. They're still tightening, uh, and they're still shrinking their balance sheet. Uh, interest rates are still rising to combat inflation. But what has happened uh, specifically over the last week is that earnings reports coming from the tech sector mainly have really given a push, a big push to the markets because Apple uh, uh, beat expectations significantly, uh, uh, as did Google and other uh, in the technology sector. So uh, whether they did well or not, but they're beating expectations is what the market's looking for, for any signs of uh, positivity. Uh, as a signal to say, okay, is this the bottom or have we reached uh, a turning point for us to get back in or or what? Uh, so uh, based on this, this is one month old from this technical analysis, uh, analyst, and we're right about that level where he would consider getting back into the market, feeling confident that we are back in a bullish trend uh, and not in a bull trap. Okay, from cnbc.com, uh, Tom Lee uh, at Fundstrat. Now I'm gonna give you some of the other side uh, where he already has come out. Uh, uh, he's been on CNBC and other outlets as well, but he is already saying that the 2022 bear market is over and stocks could hit new highs before year end. So, you, you saw the worst case scenario that Bank of America uh, and, and their research provided. And now we have another analyst uh, in the market, uh, well-known at Fundstrat, is coming out saying it's over and you know I'm predicting all-time highs by year end. We had an all-time high at the beginning of the year end, uh, beginning of the year. And he is also saying that we could reach that level or higher by year end. Leading indicators show that the CPI will be under 2% in six months. The CPI is the consumer price index, which is the inflation rate. Right now it's at 9.1%. And that's what the Fed is trying to uh, take head on by raising the interest rates. 
But for it to come back down to 2% within six months, that is very aggressive. Um, it's taken uh, the course of where we were at the beginning of the year to get to 9.1% in six months for it to come down further than where it was at the beginning of the year to get back to where the Fed is their bench for inflation, which is two to two and a half percent uh, within six months um, is very aggressive. Uh, so, and he's seeing that the S&P 500 by year end would be above the 4,800 level. From Citibank, uh, they're also in line that you know, when they say overweight in US equities, they're, they're going back in taking long positions. They're, ta they're taking up positions uh, in the market uh, within companies in this particular index, specifically the S&P 500, and they they feel that they they are confident enough to take these positions because they feel that there is a market shift and turnaround uh, for them to do so. Now, from uh, several others, you have Ritholtz, uh, Wealth Management, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, UBS. Uh, you know, common staples or, or, or uh, you know, household names, if you will, within the financial markets. Josh Brown, the CEO of Ritten Holes, he, you know, he comments, I don't think the Fed has the appetite right now uh, of getting gasoline prices down uh, to where the, they've worked so hard to get it down that they would invert the yield curve deliberately. If the Fed shrinks the balance sheet, it will negatively affect stocks. So basically, he's saying now the market is in the court of the Fed, okay? Uh, the Fed has the ball in their court. And if they continue the monetary tightening and the, the, raise, uh, the rise in, in rates, well, you're going to create this invert yield, which gets back to a couple of webinars ago that we had speaking of interest rates, where if you have the two-year treasury United States Treasury bonds, which are considered, you know, those are the bench for the risk-free rate of return. If your two years trading, uh, as it was just a couple of on Friday, it was trading at at two seventy, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, two point seven percent. Okay, for a two year U.S. Treasury, that means you would invest in that bond and you would receive two point seven percent interest for a two year time frame. Now. Go to the 10-year, the U.S. 10-year. What kind of yield or interest was it providing? It was at 2.8. So if you think about it, you know you can get a two-year U.S. Treasury for 2.7 percent. Why would you buy the 10-year for 2.8 percent? Okay, uh, and if you even go out to the 30-year, the 30-year was trading at maybe 320, if I'm not mistaken, 3.2 percent. So you can see that's what he means by the inverted yield curve where the short end uh, of the treasury curve is yielding higher than the longer end, which in theory it shouldn't be. The longer you hold an investment, the more return you should get. And the shorter term you hold the investment, the less return you should get. Um, the CIO, uh, Lisa Shallot from Morgan Stanley, the chief investment officer, a recession could likely be shallower and less damaging to corporate earnings, this is coming from Morgan Stanley, uh, than recent downturns. Damage to corporate earnings tends to be more modest during inflation-driven recessions compared to credit-driven recessions seen during the great financial crisis and the dot-com bubble. So her point here is getting back to what happened uh, in 2000 with the dot-com bubble and 2008 with the great financial crisis, where those were credit-driven uh, uh, crisis or crises. Uh, here, this is inflation-driven. She's alluding it to being an inflation-driven, and it will not be as severe, meaning it's going to be sh shallower than expected, and uh, the damage to the corporate earnings will be more modest than severe uh, when they come out, which has been the case with, we saw uh, last week with as these corporations, uh, you know, we're in earnings season right now. Uh, from JP Morgan, uh, their, their analytical team in general, they hold a positive outlook for the U.S. financial sector. Now, they're spe speaking specifically about a sector here so that we don't clump the whole S&P 500 uh, in this particular, but I'm pointing out the U.S. financial sector is the third largest weighted or weighted 
uh, third largest weighted uh, by cap uh, in the S&P 500. Uh, they uh, hold a positive outlook for the financial sector. They stated that banks have historically performed well under inflationary conditions, which we are in right now, but if it's, have suffered during recessions, which we are also in now, if you look at it from a black and white perspective. Higher inflation and slow but growing GDP is a good environment for banks. Now, we are in high inflation. There, uh, last week, there was good reported uh, good reports from the earnings uh but growing gdp you know where we were flat to slightly negative which that gets back to the technical terminology of what a recession would be so they they're pretty much in the ballpark but they're focusing their attention on the financial sector with this particular uh data from ubs ubs they did not give any forecast or predictions for the remainder of this year or beyond, but they did advise that if equity markets were to see a further slump at a level down to 3,300, investors can improve resilience of equity portfolios by investing in value stocks and healthcare. So getting back to value stocks, they pay higher dividend and healthcare uh, is the second weight, uh, the, the second largest by weight cap in the S&P 500. So their target for, let's say, getting back into the market uh, would be uh, the 3,300 level for the S&P 500 index. Key takeaways, what we want to look at from where we are today, what we've seen the first half of the year for six months, and then what happened in July, and then what we're going to be going through for the remainder of the year, uh, when we look at the S&P 500 forecasts, important, it is very important to keep in mind that the forecasts and price targets can be wrong. So I just gave you throughout this webinar so far a, a wide variation of, you know, we're going to be at all time highs by the end of the year to worst case scenario. We're going to look with by year end, we could be down 35 to 40 percent year to date. And that's a very big range and anything in between uh, is, is fair game. So this is why I say when you build your narrative and you build your strategy and you are going to use this particular product with future in, in the futures market, uh, you, can, you can do very well uh, from a hedging standpoint. And if you speculate, you've got to put in the parameters to protect yourself in case you don't get it right. You can speculate and, and you know pick any of the choices and anything in between that I just mentioned tonight and that resonates best with you and your mentality and what your thought process is 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 giving you. And but if you're going to speculate, put in your safety measures, you know your stop losses, don't be greedy uh, when you do have uh, uh, you know, when you hit your target of profitability, get out, reassess, and see what's happening. Uh, analysts provide both ends of the forecast spectrum from dropping further to reaching approximately a 40% downfall uh, on year to reaching all times high, uh, all time highs, which I just discussed. And as always, you've got to do your research. And this particular, this particular security is the most traded security in the futures market, the E-mini S&P 500. So you're going to find a lot of information out there. So by no means keep your, do not keep your blinders on and find, you know, that one bit of information or analysis that you want to believe in and ignore the rest. You've got to be able to, to look at it candidly and objectively and say, okay, how many analysts out there fall in line with what I'm thinking and how I'm trying to build out my portfolio or protect my portfolio and just put it on a spreadsheet and see, okay, well, out of all of the X amount of uh, research that I've done and looking at from a technical analysis, from a fundamental anal analysis point of view, 30% um, fall in line with what I think, 40% on the other opposite end, and then you've got 30% somewhere in between. So 
that will give you some sort of gauge of you know how accurate or inaccurate uh, analysis may be and then getting back to point number one on the key takeaways is that nobody knows where it's going to go and you know you, you have people you can see them on tv you can see them through articles uh you know any type of financial uh information outlet and you'll see people so adamant that you know this is the end or we're going to go into recession it's going to put pull us possibly into a depression by 2024 to 2026 and you're going to see all kinds of stuff out there and you've got to be very careful uh, because when individuals get out there and they they are portraying their forecasts and their analysis it's because that's what they firmly believe in and they they are dealing with institutional money and they are positioning institutional money. You're talking hundreds of millions to billions of dollars based on a particular strategy. And what you're listening to is what their strategy is for the market. Most often, more than not, is in within a short time frame. You're talking anywhere from one quarter to maximum two quarters worth of money management because they're very dynamic. They're not, you know, buy and sit on something and just let it sit until they say, oh, okay, well, I've had this position for years. Uh, now it's time for us to do something with it. So you've got to understand the mindset uh, and what the investment policy of these uh, investment banks and, um, and analysts are coming from. So you can't just take it at face value uh, and say, okay, I like what he said. I believe it makes sense. Let me go take a position. You know, because unless you're an institution and you're managing hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, chances are, you know, obviously they are using futures and options, these exchange traded derivatives that are sophisticated and they understand how to protect themselves. And that's what we have to do. Um, as always, I like to leave uh, with a quote, uh, the biggest risk of all is not taking one. Now, it's always be it's always easier to come out and say something in hindsight, especially if you didn't do something or if you did do something, and say, yeah, I should have or I would have if I had done that or done this uh, back, I would have had a whole lot more money, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, if we all bought Bitcoin back in 2010, we would all be in a different situation now. So that doesn't really help. Okay, so don't get that. What I'm getting at here is if you're going to take risk, which if you already have an investment portfolio, there is risk involved because financial markets do carry risk. Futures are a sophisticated product that allow you to enhance your portfolio performance as well as protect the portfolio that you have. So if you want ways to protect and you want a sophisticated way to speculate within parameters, this is an opportunity for you in this type of environment, specifically with future securities. This came from Melody Hobson. Uh, she's an American businesswoman. She's the president and CEO of Aerial Investments, and she's also the chairwoman of Starbucks, uh, Starbucks Corporation. Uh, so with that being said, right now, the S&P 500 is up 16 and a half points, trading at 41.35, uh, slightly up on the day. And, you know, we'll see how it does the remainder, the rain, remainder of this week as earnings continue to come out uh, through, through several uh, sectors in the market. Uh, with that being said, I'll open it up now to any questions. If anybody has any questions, please feel free. Uh, to, to send it to me on chat and I can uh, answer them the best way that I possibly can. Any questions? Going once, going twice, all right. Everybody have a very good rest of the trading week. Uh, stay sharp, stay focused, do your research. And um, Tickmill will be getting back in touch uh, with me and everyone else 
uh, when we'll be continuing. I, I'm going to be pushing to see if we can continue the market outlook uh, uh, within the future series uh, again next week, and uh, we'll we'll keep you posted. And this will also this webinar will be up on Ticknell's YouTube platform as well for you to view uh, later on on your own time. Have a great evening, and thank you very much. And we will talk later. Bye-bye.